Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of X Men 97 Episode 4 Motendo Slash Life Death Part 1, an episode that brings back Mojo and explores a relationship between Storm and Forge from Uncanny X Men number 186. Let's break down all the Easter eggs and details you missed in this episode. And remember that the best way to support us at New Rockstars is to head on over to nerdrand.shop and grab yourself one of these X Men inspired designs. I kind of just sound like Buddy Garrity there. Anyway, let's break down this episode. Now, before we even get to the X-Men intro, the opening Marvel animation title has new music compared to last week. Yeah, this one gives off the vibe of an 8-bit or 16-bit or maybe even 32-bit Konami arcade game, which is just fitting for this episode, which all feels like it's taking place inside of that kind of game. Now, I didn't mention this last week, but Storm's individual character card was removed from the opening credit sequence. While the X-Men would not have wanted her gone, I feel like she would have elected not to appear amongst them, at least for now. But added to this week's opening credit imagery is this shot of Jubilee lowering her shades with Mojo in the reflection, which comes from Season 3, Episode 10, Longshot when Jubilee was protecting Mojo's prized TV star Longshot from Mojo after Longshot escaped from Mojo World. Jubilee will later recreate the shot in the final battle with the giant version of Mojo later this episode. Also added to the sequence is this image of Wolverine and Forge with Lorna Dane in the foreground. This is from Season 3 Episode 11, Cold Comfort, when a younger Forge leads the X-Factor team. And also added is this shot of Charles mentally linking with Sebastian Shaw and Emma Frost in the inner circle. This is from Season 3 Episode 15, the Dark Phoenix Part 2, The Inner Circle. Charles is trying to find Cyclops and the rest telepathically inside the headquarters of the Inner Circle and freaks out when Emma is able to block out his mind. Okay, the episode begins with some morning coffee as Remy bristles against Magneto for knowing how many sugars the mutant who loves to call people sugar wants in her coffee. I'll take a cappuccino if you just take an orders. No. Luckily, I am giving them. Yeah, Magneto is so good at twisting everyone's words back in their faces. Gambit is back to wearing that pink rock cutoff t-shirt, doing everything in his power to thirst trap Rogue into loving him again. Actually, voice actor AJ Locasio wore this shirt at WonderCon in the past week. So it's Jubilee's 18th birthday. Beast says... Surely our youngest member deserves some jubilation on her 18th birthday. Yes, working in her first name into the sentence. And then Magneto reminds Morph of a dark past. My parents perished when I was a child. Yeah, just a reminder that in the 90s run, Magneto was a survivor from World War II, but the animators couldn't explicitly depict his oppressors as Nazis, since kids shows back in the 80s and 90s were not allowed to reference the Nazis, but X-Men 97 has been more overt about that history. So Jubilee wants to spend her birthday going to the arcade, like old times, she says, which references the first time we saw her in the 90s run. She was playing an arcade game and her powers blew up the machine. Roberto says, Genosha entering the UN is a big deal. Yeah, another shout out to Genosha, the island nation originally from the season one episode seven slave island episode but the island's current status is a mutant colony following the events of the asteroid m episode i think they keep bringing it up because cassandra nova is going to use a sentinel master mold and henry gyrick to massacre millions of mutants who live there from the 2001 grant morrison storyline that's my big theory for where this season is going i love the detail that jubilee has a long shot plush doll on her dresser she's always held on to him after shedding a tear for the guy at the end of that long shot episode also in her bedroom with the backwards in the post behind her bed might be a take on the Nine Inch Nails, which Jubilee definitely would have been a fan of as they were active in the 90s. Jubilee recognizes a new game console in a new game that were not in a room before, Motendo. The console design with the game cartridge plugged in at the top and with the controllers definitely looks like a Sega Genesis. The game cartridge depicts Cyclops, Gambit, and Wolverine fleeing a Sentinel. It actually kind of looks like the cover for the 1996 Game Gear game, X-Men Mojo World, which you know must have been at least thematically an influence for this episode. You'll notice that the cover of this console reads 16-bit, so I'm going to be referring to the graphics from here forward as 16-bit when they're depicted in the game, even if it at times it looks or sounds like 8-bit or even 32-bit. Basically, we're looking at Super Nintendo era as well as Sega Genesis or just a Konami arcade box game, and all of it's just very nostalgic, and we love it. We get some deeply unsettling body horror as Mojo's wires from the console wrap around Roberto and Jubilee and crawl up their faces and plug into their eyes. I love how gnarly it is, but ugh! 
God. I feel like these animators must have been as traumatized as I was by that scene in Superman 3 when Vera gets snatched by the supercomputer and turns into the cyborg and she went from screaming to going suddenly silent as the wires covered her face and her eyes suddenly opened as glazed over silver. <sighs> we briefly hear some mid-90s dial-up sound effects as Jubilee's mind goes online. <laughs> Yeah, everything about this show is late 90s, and I love it. So Jubilee and Roberto are attacked by a giant sentinel, and notice how its size and scale changes during this chase, which was definitely the case unintentionally with the sentinels attacking Jubilee in the pilot episode in 1992. The two of them are not sure how they got downtown, and FOH members are attacking, but they're able to get out from a ringing payphone in a booth, which is another late 90s cyberpunk nod, of course, to the simulated reality of The Matrix in 1999. But there are also some games like the Yakuza series, where you save your game at payphones. So this kind of feels like them reaching the end of that level and saving the game and then being transported to the next level. But here they're transported to Genosha, which Jubilee calls way back when Genosha, referring to the events of that season one, episode seven, Slave Island episode. Jubilee recalls how Bolivar Trask made the mutants do slave labor. And we see Blob and Sunfire, a mutant who's not Pyro or Sunspot, but has similar powers. And look, with a patch over her eye, that's Domino. But I love how they just brought her back. And you'll notice how these first two stages of the game in Motendo feature threats that are closely associated with anti-mutant bias, starting with the Sentinels and then the Friends of Humanity, and now literally a mutant slave island from Bolivar Trask. So with the finale episodes of the season being Tolerance is Extinction, a line that Gyrick said in the season premiere, we kind of know where it's all going. But these guards are killed by Absissa, more on her in a bit. So Mojo finally reveals himself. Mojo here, your primetime psycho interdimensional alien TV producer who feeds off You'll notice how Mojo is replaying footage of Wolverine from the season two Mojo Vision episode. This is the first of two Mojo episodes from the 90s run. So a bit of info on Mojo. Mojo is a disgusting television producer from Mojo World who kidnaps fighters from other worlds for his TV programs in order to boost ratings. He was introduced in the comics back in 1985 for the Longshot miniseries, and he was a race identified as Spineless Ones as writer Ann Nocenti and artist Art Adams wanted to explore the predatory nature of mass media from the writings and philosophies of people like Marshall McLuhan, and they gave Mojo wires that held his eyes open, inspired by Malcolm McDowell's apparatus and the Ludovico technique in Stanley Kubrick's The Clockwork Orange. And isn't it interesting how wires hold his eyes open, and with Roberto and Jubilee on the bed, wires went into their eyes as well. So in the Mojo Vision episode in season two, Mojo uses Spiral to kidnap the X-Men from a TV store to boost ratings and replace his TV action star Longshot. Storm and Cyclops are cast in Miami Mutants, a Miami Vice parody. Beast and Rogue star in a Star Trek type show called Rogue Star, and Gene and Wolverine are cast in a sitcom called I Dream of Gene, which obviously is a play on I Dream of Genie, but it's not really a domestic sitcom from what we see. It's weirdly an action show on the side of a building, a robot version of the Punisher cameos while Wolverine fights robot Shi'ar Imperial Guard, which is what we saw him doing in that clip. Gene shuts down Mojo's cameras, and Longshot, feeling jealous of the X-Men, shuts down the broadcast. The X-Men end up returning to their Earth, and Cyclops is like, "Mm, what the f*** just happened? Meanwhile, in the season 3, episode 10, episode Longshot, Shot, Longshot escapes Mojo World and meets Jubilee, who crushes on him. Mojo and Spiral pursue him on Earth with their hounds, and they kidnap Jubilee, trapping the X-Men in Mojo's latest show, which involves a trip to, quote, Camp Cretaceous, which obviously is the play on Jurassic Park. Mojo is again defeated and returns to Mojo World, but promises to return. And that's what he does in this episode. We find out that Mojo went on some crazy dieting and got plastic surgery, giving himself really gross abs, and I wonder if he recreated the abs he saw on Wolverine after his suit was torn open at the midsection. Mojo's explanation of how he got too thin because he's been stressed from having a terrible quarter and made the pivot to video games might be a commentary on streamers like Netflix getting into the gaming space. In 2021, Netflix made gaming a much bigger priority, and according to this article, they plan to have 86 games available to play by year's end with another 90 in development. So Mojo is now voiced by David Arrigo, who is actually the voice of Verb in Phineas and Verb, and it is noticeably less annoying and less coded as a kind of stereotypical Hollywood producer of a certain ethnicity coded for having outsized control over the media. Like Mojo previously would say things like Bubby and Bubba a lot. And I'm just glad that they toned down that aspect of the stereotype. But here he says, That's why I made the pivot to video games. And I love that the way he says the word pivot is a clear reference to Ross Geller's famous sofa moving scene in Friends. Pivot! 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 
That episode aired in 1999, but I think Mojo would be aware of it. So Mojo says that A-list mutants are expensive, saying Dazzler had a gig, don't ask, and then he lays out his plans to zap gamers' brain energy. A plot similar to another 90s superhero staple, Batman Forever, Riddler's plan to use the Vox to drain users' brainwaves. But that mention of Dazzler recalls the past that Dazzler used to be a makeup artist for Longshot on Mojo's old TV show, but she left Mojo World and became a singer. Mojo tells Jubilee that she's a main character because, quote, you connect with the youth, you're their point of view, which is funny and a little meta because she was the point of view character in the original show and was most definitely included to appeal to the younger generation. Mojo depicts an older X-Men as the older sitcom Who's the Boss? with Storm, Jean, Charles Magneto, and Cyclops posing like they are in the Tony Danza sitcom, which is funny because each of these characters at one point or another have led the X-Men in the comics. But then he switches to a different world, referencing the Cosby Show spinoff that followed Denise to college, and we see the younger and more diverse mutants represented in this lineup, but then he also hints at Jean and Scott's marital issues by casting them in divorce court? Are we going to catch up with those two in a future episode and they're like sleeping in separate bedrooms and it's awkward? Fresh food is better than frozen food. We know this, but when you're busy, it can feel so overwhelming to get everything you need for a fresh, delicious meal unless you use Factor. Factor is a meal delivery service that makes eating well easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen meals right to your doorstep. So you can skip shopping, chopping, prepping, and cleaning and just focus on eating deliciously. Plus, Factor meals are ready to eat in just two minutes. And like, yeah, I've got time for that. Factor meals are pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved. There are over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more. Plus, there are over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. You've probably heard me say the same thing about HelloFresh in the past, but Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and I switch back and forth between the two all the time. Yeah, so recently I got this delicious meal with like an even better sauce that came with it. It was just so safe every and amazing. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code ROCKSTARS50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next four boxes. That's code ROCKSTARS50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first Factor box plus 20% off your next four boxes while your subscription is active. So on to the game. On Mojo screens, we see Magneto laughing over the world and then the start screen for the game, X-Men The Rise of Jubilee, copyright 1997 by Motendo Games. There's this space-themed background, like the background of every episode's title sequence, and then we hear a 16-bit version of Ron Wasserman's theme song. We see the character select screen that kind of looks like a reference to the X-Men arcade game. And on the screen, the options are Jubilee, Colossus, Sunspot, Magic, Gambit, and then there's a blank spot for an unlocked character. And then if you look closely to the right of that, barely noticeable, this character has white hair and the X logo on the upper chest. This is Cable. And I think it's another clue pointing to baby Nathan Summers coming back in a few episodes as a fully grown Cable. Original Gambit voice actor Chris Potter is confirmed to be voicing Cable on this season. Jubilee and Roberto get loaded into stage one dystopian street where they face a sentinel which echoes the first episode of the series in 1992 the jubilee centric night of the sentinels part one the 16-bit game animation echoes the konami games of the side-scrolling beat-em-up area clearing variety like the x-men arcade game from 1992 or the teenage mutant ninja turtles konami game from 1989 which also begins with a descent through a skyline and even has similar manhole cover designs the camera passes this wanted poster of a grid with 16 mutants this is taken directly from the cover of uncanny x-men 141 from 1980 to 1981. It's part of the Days of Future Past storyline, and the mutants on the grid even line up with the white bars even being the slain markers from the Days of Future Past cover. So, top row, that's Cyclops, Colossus, Storm, Nightcrawler. Underneath that, Angel, Iceman, Beast, Sprite. And then, third row, it was Magneto on the comic cover, but now it's Gambit, then Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch and Wolverine. And then at the bottom, that's either Charles or Cassandra Nova, and then Gold Balls, aka Egg, then Havoc, and then Banshee. So, yeah, some potentially fun clues there. Fabio Medina, Gold Balls got a reference from Jubilee in episode one of The Danger Room, and he plays a big role in more recent X-Men comics as one of the five in the Krakoa storyline. And my big theory for this season is that we are going to get introduced to Charles Mumadry, evil twin from the womb, Cassandra Nova, who will be the villain of Deadpool 3, and it's going to set up that Grant Morrison Genosha mutant genocide storyline in this season's three-part finale, Tolerance is Extinction. And then also, yeah, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, yes please! This poster and its wall get destroyed by a sentinel, and I love how Jubilee and Roberto see themselves in the normal X-Men 97 animation, but their surroundings are all that 16-bit Konami game, and that's how the crowd sees them. And I love the detail that while Jubilee can take out the one purple and red 
Combat Sentinel with a jump kick, a differently colored blue and orange one signaling a higher stage enemy requires three hits, which follows the color hierarchy of games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Then there's a green and teal one, which flies, they can fly now, and Jubilee uses her power-up move of lowering her shades and blasting the back with fireworks, a move that I would imagine she can only do like once every now and then when it charges up. We get a shot of Mojo's cheering crowd, but unfortunately there's no shot of that random creepy human doctor who just stared at camera from season 2 episode 11. We learned that Mojo was just sucking in his gut this whole time, and now he lets the flab fly out now that Jubilee and Roberto cannot see him. So the next stage takes Jubilee and Roberto to the Savage Land, which was the recurring jungle setting from season 2 of the 90s run. They fight Sauron, the Pteranodon mutant Dr. Carl Lycos. He was one of Mr. Sinister's experiments in the series, and helps Sinister conquer the Savage Land, but ends up getting defeated and joining Kazar's tribe. Absissa glitches the game again, restoring Jubilee's HP, and Spiral works to track down the bug in the code. Spiral, remember, is the six-armed mutant who worked as Mojo's henchman in the past episodes of Morph, turned into Spiral last episode, implying that Morph must know who Spiral is. So the next level is Asteroid M. That's from the 90s run, the Sanctuary arc. Wolverine brought up Asteroid M in a past episode of this season. This was Magneto's space-based mutant colony that led to the mutants resettling on Genosha. Roberto calls this era of his history with his mother and how it made her spooked of her mutants, with Roberto's mother showing up as his greatest fear in the Fire Made Flesh episode. It's just another reminder of the anti-mutant bigotry that reaches very high places, and Genosha could be in a lot of trouble. Mojo deploys a boring robotic version of Magneto against Jubilee as this boss battle, and Jubilee, as a gamer, smartly waits for the attack pattern to cycle in order to find a window in which to attack Magneto, and she uses the extra life planted by Absissa to revive Roberto. Absissa hacks them out of the game server and transports them to a very 90s kid cyberpunk 3D sort of landscape. We see statues of all the X-Men, and they all have spiky shoulders that match her armor. Now, in the comics, Absissa is actually a twisted version of Jubilee from an alternate future. This is in Wolverine Volume 2, number 53 in 1992. Jubilee was captured by Mojo and her future self and brought to the Big Crunch, which was the big collapse of all matter in the universe that preceded the next Big Bang. And that's how we get Absissa. But here, Absissa is a less antagonistic presence. She's just a helpful older mentor, and she's voiced by Allison Court, the voice actor who portrayed Jubilee in the original animated series and made a cameo as a White House tour guide in X2. Absissa says she's the one beta test version of Jubilee from the code of the game who survived. She's kind of like that episode of Hang the DJ and Black Mirror, where there was just like countless different versions of the trial test in the code, and there's just one couple that survived. But this Jubilee has relived Jubilee's historical hits over and over, and provides to Jubilee this interesting message about breaking free from one's nostalgic impulses, and instead just living in the present real world with friends and family. It's a lesson that I think we all need to hear, to just let go of our need for our present realities to reflect the childhood joys that are so precious to us from our past, from cartoons and video games, and to just, you know, in general, unplug. During their talk, Jubilee says, so Magneto was right. There's actually a story arc in the X-Men comics titled Magneto is Right that involves Magneto taking over Xavier's school while Charles is in space for life-saving treatment. This comic is also where they got Magneto's new look for the animated series. So they look over to the giant X-Men arcade game with pictures of Cyclops, Colossus, Wolverine, Storm, and Nightcrawler, and Gambit, and a giant Mojo crawls out of it as a final boss, like Giant Ursula and the Little Mermaid. Jubilee and Epsissa join hands to zap Giant Mojo, and we hear some rocking anime music. He promises to gut them in the sequel, which is worrisome, and Mojo recoils, stunned from his control station as Spiral shoves him over. Roberto and Jubilee wake up back in Jubilee's room. The Motendo has melted, and the two share a kiss as literal sparks fly. Now, in the original series, melting electronics was one of the first signs of Jubilee's powers. Her foster mom said to her foster dad that maybe she was a mutant, and he replied, are you kidding? Look at what she did to the VCR just by touching it. Notice how the animators really linger on the romance of this moment, because it feels like they really needed to set the tone for this shift in this episode as it moves on to the life death part of it. So life death was a love story title, sort of, from the Uncanny X-Men number 186 in 1984, when Storm has lost her powers after being blasted by a weapon by Gyrick, but while saving Rogue in a boat incident. She ends up recovering with Forge in Texas. Forge has a bionic leg after an incident in Vietnam. The two end up developing an attraction for each other, but Storm discovers that the weapon that took her powers was actually created by Forge. Really, the issue is known for Chris Claremont's writing and the romantic exchanges between the two and their inner thoughts of each other as Storm grapples with her transition from goddess to normal human. You'll notice that Storm in this episode wears a pair of white overalls, as she does in that comic issue. Forge gives Storm a bowl of bison chili, and she notices how both his hand and leg are cybernetic, and he says that he just lost them in a war, but he doesn't go into detail about what war it was or when this would be. Forge helps Storm rediscover the sensation of flying as she rides this horse, recreating the romantic moment with Jack and Rose on the deck of the ship in Titanic. Even without her powers, Storm can kind of sense which direction the wind is blowing, which weirds her out about 
about the owl because it's flying in the wrong direction. But of course, there's a deeper darkness to this bird that she's really sensing because it's not a real owl. It's a transdimensional demon bird who doesn't fly by the winds of this dimension. Forge takes Storm into his workshop where she passes this photo of Forge as the leader of the X Factor. He's depicted here with Havoc, Lorna Dane, Multiple Man, Quicksilver, Strong Guy, and Wolfsbane. We also briefly see this photo of Forge from his military days with this older man. This might be the craziest detail of this episode because this is Gottfried Adler from season one, episode nine, The Cure. So at some point, Mystique killed Adler and assumed his identity. And we're not sure when exactly that happened, but this looks like it would have been before that based on how young Forge would be. Adler was the one credited with inventing the power dampening collars. So this makes us wonder if X-Force and Adler were working with the government together since the X-Force was backed by the government. And this could be a way Mystique comes back into the show. Forge tries to reverse the effects of Executioner's weapon, putting Storm in a chamber, but when Storm reaches up toward the owl, begging the winds to heed her commands, they don't respond, and she breaks down crying. Forge confesses to Storm that his early designs helped lead to the weaponry that took her power, but he says, I could live forever, and still my endless imagination would never conceive of a thing as perfect as you. And he references a scientist in Scotland that would be Dr. Gottfried Adler, who designed those power dampening collars, and his push for a cure for mutants would actually end up making them slaves of Apocalypse. So as we head into the future, this guy is going to be extremely important. Storm rides out into the rain, but encowers this demonic presence and falls right back into Forge's house? Kind of like dying in a game and respawning back at your save point, if you think about it. But here, a giant bird demon attacks. I feast on misery, and I... The adversary shall not waste my meal. So the Adversary is an ancient mystical demonic entity referred to as the Great Trickster by the Cheyenne. The Adversary's native dimension was one of chaos, which the Adversary loved and sought to spread to Earth's dimension, overturning order for the mere sake of just doing so. He comes up in Uncanny X-Men number 188 following this life-death storyline in the 80s, but we learn that the Adversary first encountered Forge back in Vietnam. Forge kind of summoned him when nine of his men died, and that decision is what resulted in the Adversary's link to the Earth dimension. We re-encounter the Adversary with Forge in Dallas as the adversary fights the X-Men and the Freedom Force, and this results in Forge having to cast a spell to sacrifice nine X-Men to banish the adversary. They do die, but they are brought back to life. Here, the adversary is voiced by Allison Seeley Smith, the same actor who voices Storm, so Storm is really hearing these words from herself, but I wonder if there will be a different voice in the future episodes. Now, the adversary wasn't known for taking the form of a giant bird, but the fact that she does here is just terrifying, and it also makes the demon a fitting foe for Storm as a bird of prey that can fly and taunt this supposed goddess, as Forge called her. In fact, I think Forge calling Storm a goddess is what triggered this. So Forge has this combined reputation of a gearhead, but also someone crossed with mystical forces. It's arguably his relationship with the adversary that gave him this foresight and his ability to build a better self to live long into the future. Yes, it's a bit weird structurally this episode to pair Motendo with life death like this, but I believe the lessons are the same. That if we try to relive our greatest hits, whether they're in a video game simulacra of our lives, or repeating our own magic words as mistress of the elements, that is when we are most vulnerable to our demons. So where does Storm go here with the adversary? We're going to find out in Life Death Part 2, but only after a Remember It episode, episode 5, which despite those words being associated with Gambit, I think it's going to be an episode following Forge in the future, as well as Cable, whatever destination here that Bishop took young baby Nathan Summers to, as we see his transition into Cable, and all this comes together as Forge and Dr. Adler are all connected in this crazy time travel plot. We're going to find out why Bishop was back in the present day. Forge, I think, will be the link in time for all of it. And right there at his side will be his demonic adversary. That was everything I saw in this episode of X-Men 97. Thank you so much for watching. Comment down below with your thoughts and stuff you liked in this episode. Follow me at EA Boss. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network for breakdowns and coverage of everything you love. Thanks for watching, Dylan Panthers. Bye.